Okay, we'll go ahead and, and get started. I will, I will preface this by saying this is not going to be a long class. It's probably not going to go the full time. Um, lavender is not that hard to grow. There's just a few things you need to do uh, to, to make it happy, and then you'll be, you'll be happy as well. But most of the time, people that are not successful with growing lavender are, are uh, just not giving it what it needs. So here again, um, common name is lavender. Um, it is a genus of about 47 known species of flowering plants, and they are in the mint family. Um, you think about all the plants that are in the mint family and how prolific some of those are. Um, obviously, lavender is not uh, like some of the other mints, but it is in that family. And if you don't, um, if you don't know if a, if a plant is in the mint fam family, you can look at the stem, and the stem is going to be square. And that, that pretty much tells you right off the bat that it's in the mint family. Uh, they're native to the Cape Verde and Canary Islands uh, across Europe, northern and eastern Africa, uh, Africa, the Mediterranean, Southwest Asia, all the way to Southeast India. So they, they're native to a large area um, on the other side of the world. Uh, many members of the genus are cultivated for culinary use. <clears throat> we probably know them more uh, for essential oils and traditional medicines and cosmetics, especially. Um, you know, the lavenders use a lot in those. Uh, I will say there is a little disclaimer here. There's no high quality, and I say high quality, clinical evidence that lavender has any effects on disease or improves health. However, uh, there are compounds that have been pulled from them that they do use in medicine. So it, it's kind of, that's not necessarily um, a 100% true statement. So we'll just take it from, from that. So we'll talk about some of the compounds in, in a little bit. The genus does include annuals, uh, short-lived herbaceous perennial plants, even short shrub-like perennials, and we would call them sub-shrubs uh, or kind of shrubby plants. The leaf shape is variable across the genus, including simple pinnately tooth, um, pinnate. There's even some broader, flatter leaf ones out there uh, that are in the family. So, so what we think of as lavender is a very minute portion of lavender plants is what we uh, actually think of as growing our garden. Most species leaves do have the little tiny hairs on them. Those are called trichomes, and that is where the little essential oils are. Uh, plants with leaf hairs that, that produce the oils on those uh, leaf hairs, that is actually a mechanism to help them ward off insects, because a lot of insects don't like to get that sticky oil on them, so they will, will avoid those plants. Uh, flowers are born on whorls. Um, if you look closely, I don't know if you've ever really looked, you can see in the background of the picture there uh, that the uh, flowers are actually in little whorls up the stem, uh, kind of like a whorled arrangement of leaves would be. Uh, so it just gives you a, an idea that look closer at that plant, there's a few little oddities about it. Um, and the, the colors, um, believe it or not, there's more than just that lavender colors like where it has how it got its name. Uh, there's actually blues, violets, uh, lilacs, blackish purples, and even a yellow one out there, believe it or not. <clears throat> Basically, there's two types of lavenders that, we, that actually will grow well in Kentucky. The first is lavendula angustifolia. That's the English lavender. It's probably what most of us um, are familiar with, but also you may be growing the other type too and not even know it. You may be growing the other, uh, the, the hybrid we'll talk about just in a minute. Uh, the English lavenders are hardy to about zone five, uh, and they often bloom twice in one season. Um, some varieties only bloom one time. Uh, the, the English usually blooms twice. There are hundreds of varieties of English lavender uh, available depending on the color and size of the plant um, that you desire. Some people may want a smaller uh, one foot tall plant. And some other people that are growing for production want the largest plant they can get to get the most uh, harvest off of that uh, field. Here's a few popular varieties of English lavender. Uh, there's Vera, which is an heirloom uh, variety. But this is one that's really extremely cold hardy, um, hardy to minus 20. Um, that's probably the coldest uh, hardy one out there. And uh, if you notice the flowers on that one, they're a little darker purple and they're uh, set a little further on the stem apart from each other than some of the other lavenders are. So you'd probably have to harvest more uh, to get the same amount of flowers if you were looking to dry the flowers. We have Buena Vista, which is next. It's a fragrant bloomer, a fragrant flower. And also it blooms twice um, in two big flushes uh, during the growing season. So you'll get a spring one, maybe a late summer fall uh, flower color from that, or flowering from that one. Um, it's also a bicolor there. If you look closely, you'll see the buds are darker purple and when the flower opens, it's a lighter purple. 
And then we have Munstead, uh, which is probably one of the, these last two are the most common that you, you'll see sold around here. Um, and probably two of the easiest to grow for us. We have Munstead there, has, it's very fragrant. Uh, lavender, as you can see, it's first flush of flower there. It is completely covered in flowers. Um, it's a cool lavender. There's also a Munstead violet out now too, that's got a little different, more violet uh, color to it. And then we had hit, we have Hitco. Uh, this is a freer flowering variety. Um, it usually, we may throw a few flowers out even during the summer. Um, you know, it's it's not gonna uh, stick to the, the time frame of only blooming uh, a couple times. It'll, it'll send out flowers periodically. Uh, but this one is also has, uh, it's good for long lasting uh, flowers because it stays in a vase for a, for a while longer than some of the others will. The second lavender that we can grow in Kentucky is a hybrid of the uh, English lavender, which is Angustifolia. And so it's a hybrid of Angustifolia and Latifolia, um, which is this hybrid usually uh, is referred to as lavender. So if you were to look up lavender on the internet, you're gonna come up with the variety, some of the varieties we're talking about. These are the hybrids. Um, they're usually, usually the larger plants and they bloom only once um, later in the summer and produce a sterile seed. So you don't have to worry about these plants seeding for you, but these are also sometimes known as French hybrids. Um, if you look around the internet, I know there's a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, I guess, I wouldn't say some, some, some things that are wrong about uh, when they, some, some companies will call some of these English lavenders when they're actually uh, hybrids. Um, so the hybrid is going to be a lavendula intermedia. intermedia. So anytime, if you want to know whether you've actually got an English lavender or if you've got uh, a, a hybrid, just look for the uh, botanical name. If they don't give you the botanical name, then um, you'll have to just look up based on the variety to make sure. Uh, the lavenins are very popular because they do produce larger quantities of essential oil, um, but it's not considered as high quality uh, essential oil as the English lavenders. Uh, both types of lavenders have a place in the landscape, though, also as a cash crop. Um, some places may not care if they're buying uh, lavender from you, if, if it's an English lavender or a, a hybrid. But uh, just know that a lot of times you're going to probably, if you're buying essential oil, probably 90% of the time it's going to be from one of these that's considered a lesser quality because they get so much more oil um, out, of, out of the flowers off of this uh, hybrid. A few of the varieties of the hybrids, we have Grosso, which is uh, has a nice uh, violet flowers there. You can see a very strong scent. Um, and then we have Phenomenal. That's a, a larger lavender. It's good for potpourri and it's extremely fragrant. And also it's a more blue flower than a lavender or purple uh, flower. Then we have Provence. Um, it's probably one of the better lavenders for us uh, because it does do well in humid summers. Um, it's got a really strong fragrance as well and nice large flower spikes. And then we have Empress Purple there if you want more of a purple flower. And this one is good for uh, fresh bouquets because it has a scent, a good scent. Uh, and also it has long, uh, sturdy flower spikes. So <clears throat> for putting into a, uh, a, a bouquet, you know, the long stems are really good because you can place them differently in the, the bouquet as opposed to see Grosso over there uh, in the first pictures, it's got kind of a shorter flower spike. <clears throat> And then the last type that we can grow here are the Spanish lavenders. Uh, they're not cold hardy though. So um, usually we'll just use those as annuals and they're, they're good in containers and outdoor beds and such. Um, I didn't go through and put some varieties here because for most of us, we're gonna wanna grow the, the perennial types and the types that we can uh, plant and that will come back on their own each season. So lavender can be planted in spring through fall in, in our area. Um, there's some, some research done by New Mexico State um, that said that in their climate, uh, fall planted lavender survives better. Um, they're a drier climate than we are, obviously, so that may may uh, been some of that reason for that. Um, they also said it uh, established quicker and produced more flowers, but uh, for us, we can plant both seasons, spring or fall. Um, the plant size depends uh, on when you can plant, though. Um, if it's something in a four inch or larger pot, then you can plant it in the fall or the spring. There'd be no problem with that. Um, usually you want to plant it uh, early enough in the fall that it can get rooted in well. But the smaller plants that you may get uh, at the stores, you know, they're four inch pots or something like that. You're going to definitely want to plant those in uh, the spring to make sure they get rooted in and get established well before uh, winter sets in. Usually in our 
area, the winter cold is not, not going to be the problem. It's going to be the, the moisture in our soils, which we'll talk about in the next slide. <clears throat> as far as planting, lavenders do prefer full sun. Uh, they also prefer more of an alkaline soil. Um, so if you've got, you know, a, an acidic soil, you're going to have to do something to raise that pH. Uh, obviously, we'd want you to get a, uh, a soil test. That way you'll know your pH ahead of time. Most of you around here or around most parts of Kentucky, I shouldn't say around here, there are parts of Kentucky that have acidic soils, but most are going to be in the, the mid sixes, I would think. Um, but you never know. Um, there are spots that are more acidic than that. But if you do have an acidic soil, you're definitely going to have to raise that pH with, by adding some lime. Um, also, if you're uh, in an area that's got heavy clay soils, you definitely want to amend that soil. That's usually what is the death knell for lavender in this state uh, is our heavy wet clay soils and the plants just can't uh, survive that. So you wanna loosen that soil up. You can also raise that bed up so it'll drain faster as well. Um, you can even plant on a berm if you need to. But um, the, uh, another thing you can do is, is add the uh, bark to your soil here. Basically, this is just uh, some one quarter inch bark mulch that you can just work an inch of that into your soil um, and just till that right in and that'll loosen that up and it'll help it drain uh, for a few seasons. You may have to add a little more um, periodically, but that's gonna help loosen that soil and, and also uh, help it drain during those times that it's really wet. Um, other things you could use, um, you would think that would make it drain well, which it would, but it also will cause you some other problems. So if you use sand or gravel and heavy clay soil, what do you end up with? You end up with concrete, so you don't want that. So um, you want to add something organic uh, that's going to loosen it up, not something that maybe is going to tighten that up even further. Um, another thing you think about is these are not heavy feeding plants. They don't need a lot of organic matter and a lot of fertilizer. So um, you know, you think, oh, add compost, but that extra nutrients are not going to be that welcome with these plants, believe it or not. They're not heavy feeders. And if you think about where they're native to, they're native to areas that have rocky uh, soils that drain quickly and don't have a lot of nutrients. As far as spacing, you want to plant your lavender um, as a crop. Say you're going to plant it as a crop, spacing is going to depend on the size of the cultivar uh, and ranges. They may range from two to three feet within the row to three to six feet between the rows. It just depends on the varieties when you're doing, doing them in rows, say for some commercial production. Um, if you're gonna translate into putting that into a bed, you're probably gonna need, uh, give a plant maybe three feet, um, you know, plumb three feet or so apart. And they're probably still gonna grow and end up touching sooner or later. Uh, lavender, again, is not competitive. It does not respond well to weed pressure. It does not respond well uh, uh, to a lot of fertilizer either. So there's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, another thing, if you can keep the weeds down, if you're growing in a field production, they're going to put some kind of uh, uh, landscape fabric or something down between the rows to keep the weeds down. Uh, in your garden uh, setting, you're just going to use uh, some compost or something like that. I'm not compost, I'm sorry. Uh, some uh, mulch or something like that to keep the weeds down. And you can always put some, uh, um, a little bit of uh, preen or, or some pre-emergent down uh, if, if you need to, to keep the weeds out. Uh, another thing is don't put a lot of other perennials close by that may encroach on lavender, because again, it doesn't not compete well. Another thing is it is drought tolerant once it is established, but you know, you may need to give it a little bit of supplemental irrigation, um, especially if we have a dry period when it's, uh, you know, getting close to sending up flowers. You want to make sure you give a little water then because you want to make sure you get the most production or the most flowers you can get out of. And again, back to watering. Uh, in general, you want to water once or twice a week immediately after planting. That's going to depend on the weather, obviously. Um, if we've got rain, then you don't need to, to water. But it's also going to depend on how small the plants are. A smaller plant is probably going to need water more often than a bigger plant uh, would. Um, and then you want to water your mature plants uh, every two to three weeks until bud formation. Uh, again, that's going to be dependent upon how much natural rainfall we have. Uh, and then you're going to do once or twice weekly until harvest, depending on your weather. The main thing if it is if you're wanting to even grow a small amount in your garden, um, if, if you want to do something with those flowers, you want to make sure you keep that plant healthy uh, while that uh, whole flowering uh, uh, season is, is upon you. And then you want to apply rock or bark mulch or landscape fabric. If you put landscape fabric down just to uh, 
keep some other weeds out um, and also keep that fabric away from the crown of the plant. Um, that could cause more moisture that may cause you some issues later into the, the uh, winter season. Believe it or not, um, lavender actually does or is, is pretty easy to propagate. Um, the best time to take your cuttings from your lavender plant is right after they've bloomed. So you can think about this, if you're growing the English types, they're gonna uh, have a couple bloom, blooming seasons, but you would wanna wait, especially in the spring, right after flowering. Uh, and then if you're growing the hybrids and you wanna take cuttings of those, you're, you know, your cuttings are gonna be later in the season because it blooms later, and, it, and they only bloom one time. Uh, you do wanna take your cuttings from stems with no flower buds on them, obviously. Uh, so um, you know the flower buds are not gonna help your cutting. Uh, it's just gonna drain nutrients uh, or drain some energy from that plant that it might need to grow roots. You want to remove the leaves from the bottom half of the cutting, as you can see in the picture there. And then you're just going to insert uh, that cutting uh, into a well-draining sterile potting soil or uh, even some vermiculite. You can use rooting hormone if you would like to use it uh, before you stick that in the soil, but it's not really necessary. Um, they do root pretty easily. Um, and then, you know, you want to label your cultivar if it's something you care about. It may, if it's not something you care about, you've just got a few lavender plants in the garden and you want to take cuttings on them, then by all means, just uh, take your cuttings. Uh, after you've got your cutting stuff, you want to water well. Um, you don't want to miss these regularly. Uh, you know, make sure that's staying moist uh, because, again, they don't have any roots and we're trying to get them uh, to grow roots. You also want to cover that pot with a plastic, loosely fitting, fitted uh, plastic bag or even a plastic bag with holes poked in it just to keep that moisture up over that container where those plants can uh, go ahead and get adequately rooted in. The other thing is once you've put that plastic bag over that, those cuttings, make sure those cuttings stay in the shade. If you put that in direct sunlight, even if it's indoors in a window, it can get too hot into that bag pretty quickly and cause you a lot of issues, uh, maybe even kill your cutting. <clears throat> once your uh, cuttings have rooted, uh, you can transplant those uh, you know, into smaller pots. Um, and then once the plants have developed vigorous root systems, they can even be put in the garden. Um, that's, but doing this, I would want to probably uh, get those cuttings started as early as possible. That way they, they'll get rooted and you can go ahead and have a good root system and put those in the garden and give them plenty of time to get rooted in before we have uh, some winter weather. Um, lavender does respond well to uh, pruning. Uh, it's very important for these. Uh, if flowers on new growth, the plants should be pruned every year uh, after they are established. If not, you'll get woody growth with less flowers. And for most of us, we're growing these, uh, you know, as flowering plants. Pruning should take place when the green leaves start to emerge from the base of the plant in the spring. So it's going to be pretty early whenever you're going to want to uh, prune these. You're going to remove approximately one third of the top of the plant, uh, and that's going to stimulate new growth, which will stimulate more flowers uh, for you. Um, again, pruning keeps this from getting uh, turned into more of a shrub with less flowers. So we're going to keep new growth coming out from this plant each season. So you want to prune again after flowering uh, or during flowering, even depending on your harvesting goals. If you're harvesting the lavender flowers uh, to dry or to make some oils or something with, then obviously you're going to you know, cut those off and that's going to be your pruning. Otherwise, you're going to prune back all your shoots at least by one third uh, after flowering. And this little picture from the spruce, um, you know, it just gives you an idea of how you would cut that plant back. And then there is a do not cut down to the wood base. So you don't want to cut to the, to the woody part down at the very base of the plant. But you do want to make sure you take that top off that plant after flowering. Again, that's going to stimulate new growth as well which is gonna make a healthier plant. And if you're growing the English type, uh, that's gonna speed up uh, your regrowth and get you another flowering. As far as harvesting, um, you wanna harvest the lavender stems in the morning hours when they are the freshest. Uh, that's also when they're gonna have the most oil concentration on those little trichomes or little hairs on the leaves that we talked about. Um, and you do want to go ahead and harvest these when about 50% of the flower buds are, have opened. So uh, it's not going to be a full flowering. I mean, you're going to see the little buds because they're, uh, they're colored as well before they open. But uh, you, know, you want about 50% of those flower buds open. Uh, and then as far as 
as, at harvesting these or cutting these. You can use a sickle or pruning shears to cut the stems. Uh, and you can make the, you know, the stems as long as you want and the bundles as many as you want. Generally, people uh, will put 50 to 100 stems and then secure it with a rubber band. And if you can secure it with a rubber band pretty tight, um, that's going to be good because remember that rubber band's going to keep squeezing. So once the moisture comes out of these plants, it's still going to squeeze and keep your little bundle together. Uh, if not, if you use string or something like that, uh, if you didn't tie it tight enough, uh, once that moisture's gone, those uh, flower spikes could just fall out of your bundle. You also want to make sure that you put you dry these uh, in a cool, dark place where there's good air circulation. Um, a lot of people think that heat would be better to dry these down. It would dry them faster, but you're going to lose some quality from that. So uh, a cooler, dark place is going to be better than a hotter, dark place. So uh, basements are great uh, as long as you got some airflow. You can even put them in a, a building, but make sure you have airflow through that building or through a carport or something like that um, just to get them uh, dried down. You don't want a lot of moisture. And I know a lot of us, you know, if you hang them in a barn or something like that, you know, we're kind of at the mercy of the weather with the humidity, but they should dry down just fine even in a barn or something like that. Basically, as far as pests and disease problems go, there are very few. Um, they are susceptible, and that's usually what gets them around here are the root rot, such as Phytophthora. You can see the picture there, even though they've got some landscape, landscape fabric down, they've got some problems, and you can see it's kind of uh, that dead plant, and then you got the one next behind it uh, that's half dead, and the next one behind that's starting to get it. So those soil-borne diseases are something that can travel in the field and can infect these plants. Usually, um, these root rots are going to be somewhere that is either a lower spot or we've had a lot of wet weather and they're in clay soil and that soil staying wet and it's letting that uh, disease really set in. So as long as you follow the rules of make sure that you've got your soil <coughs> either raised and or or both added uh, uh, some bark or something to loosen that soil up where it'll drain quicker, you're probably going to be able to avoid some of these uh, root rots. But those are the ones that that's usually what gets us is just the cold wet soils uh, say in Kentucky during the winter, uh, and it just allows these root rots to set in and kill the plant. Another thing, believe it or not, that you can have a problem with are grasshoppers. They love lavender. Uh, I know some years we have a huge grasshopper population, some years we don't, but that's something to keep, a, keep an eye out. Um, they, will, they could come in and really do some damage on these plants. They really like them. Uh, and then some areas, deer may damage plants for browsing or trampling on those. Um, you know, if you've got deer in your area, if you're like me, uh, periodically they'll come in and just graze everything if you don't do anything to keep them out. But uh, they, they're not going to be very specific to just lavender, but if you're growing a large field of it, they're probably going to be an issue as well. So there's a lot of things we can use uh, lavender for, but one of the biggest things is uh, the lavender oil. Um, Commercially, the plant is grown mainly for this production of the, the uh, lavender oil. The English lavenders, again, supposed to be the, the best uh, oil. Um, it does give you sweet overtones and can be used in balms and salves, perfumes, cosmetics, as I said earlier. Um, there's also some topical applications for your skin. It's really uh, something that's used a lot. Then we have lavender the intermediate, which again, that's the hybrid we talked about earlier. Sometimes that's uh, called Dutch lavender. Uh, lab Lavendin is another name for it we talked about earlier. Uh, it also gives you essential oil, but it, again, it's considered not as high quality um, uh, as the English lavender because of the terpenes, uh, including the camphor, uh, which, you know, it gives a little sharper overtone to the fragrance and some people may not like it as well as uh, the, uh, the, the English types. Um, and then um, again, the lavandula intermedia um, and then the hybrids, Lavendin, the lavendins are widely cultivated for commercial use since their flowers tend to be bigger. Um, they just give you more production, so people use that a lot more. Uh, but again, it's giving you a little uh, less high quality oil out of it. Most of us probably wouldn't know the difference, though, to be honest with you. Um, it's, another thing I mentioned earlier was there's no uh, clinical studies, high quality clinical studies uh, that said it was good for our health and stop the disease. However, uh, there are phytochemicals that have been extracted from lavender that have been used uh, for a lot of medical purposes. 
Um, there's over a hundred phytochemicals uh, found in, in lavender, believe it or not. Um, then the extracts of uh, lavandula and gustifolia, essential oil, um, that's the English lavender oil, have been used a lot of different uh, ways pharmacologically. Uh, believe it or not, there's medicines that they've pulled out for, for ep epilepsy, anxiety, dementia. Um, there's also some antimicrobial, antifungal uh, products out there that have got phytochemicals in it from lavender. So um, there is a lot of compounds in this plant that may have been pulled out and, and, and are doing some really good work for uh, the, the health industry. Culinary uses, um, I've not used them a lot in, in culinary or in cooking, but uh, some people have have and do, and I've eaten a few things, and it, it, it's really uh, nice in some of these uh, dishes, but uh, it's used usually, so the English lavender that's most commonly used uh, in cooking, uh, Munstead is a variety, um, talked about that earlier, um, it has an aromatic quality, gives you a sweet fragrance with lemon or citrus notes, um, it's also used as, uh, as a spice or a condiment in pastas, salads, salad dressings, and desserts. Uh, and then the buds and greens are used in teas, uh, and then honeybees make a monofloral honey known as lavender honey. So if you know someone's got a large lavender farm, if you get, uh, you know, a honeybee colony out there close by, then you'll get the lavender honey and you'll get a little bit of that uh, lavender flavor in the honey. Uh, and then for most cooking applications, the dried buds, which are the flowers, um, are used. Uh, lavender uh, greens have more of a subtle flavor. Uh, when compared to the, and it's more compared to rosemary. So a lot of times you can use the green portion, uh, the leaf portion of lavender. Uh, if you don't have rosemary, you can add it to a dish and it'll give you a similar flavor as rosemary. Um, the potency of the lavender flower increases with drying, which necessitates more uh, sparing use. Uh, so uh, if you use too much dried lavender, you're gonna get a heavy soapy aftertaste. So you have to watch that. Um, just note, um, to reduce by two thirds the dry amount in recipes which call for fresh lavender. And it's just like when you do uh, any other herbs, you know, when they're dried, you use less depending on the herb, but most of the time you use less. Now, the lavender buds uh, can amp amplify both sweet and savory dishes, flavors in dishes, and are sometimes paired with sheep's milk and goat's milk cheeses, uh, I guess because of that the citrusy note does pair well with, with those cheeses. Some other uh, uses, um, lavender flowers are occasionally blended with uh, black and green and herbal teas to give you a, a, a lavender tea. Um, they're also added to baked goods and desserts. Um, it does pair well with chocolate. And in the United States, both lavender syrup and dried lavender buds are used to make lavender scones and marshmallows. Uh, lavender buds are also put into sugar. You can uh, put it in sugar and let it set for a few weeks and you'll get a, a, a little lavender flavor to your sugar. That's probably a very common use um, uh, around here. Um, and then uh, lavender is also good in breads and recipes that call for rosemary. Again, the leaves are gonna be what you would use instead of the flower buds uh, if you're wanting to get that rosemary flavor. Um, and also it can be uh, used decoratively in dishes uh, or spirits. Sometimes they'll drop some down into a glass of champagne or um, in, you know some maybe some lemonade or something like that, just to give you a little uh, appearance of, of something a little extra in your uh, glass. And also you can add them to savory dishes, it's good for stews. Um, and also, as we always do, we use them for scents, so they're good for flans and custards and sorbets and those types of things as well. Uh, just the greens here, uh, again, they use similarly to rosemary and combined with rosemary to flavor meat and vegetables and savory dishes. And if, this is kind of the same way as you would with uh, rosemary. Uh, one thing I did want to uh, uh, say before we open up for questions was, um, I know some people are probably wondering how um, they get the essential oils out of these uh, plants. Um, best thing to do uh, is dry your, your, uh, your bloom stalks there. Uh, it kind of uh, drying it gets rid of extra moisture. It also kind of condenses the oils, uh, so it makes it easier to extract. Uh, the commercial um, companies, they distract by distillation. I uh, know at, for home, we're probably not going to have the ability to do that. Uh, so at home, we would do what we would call a tincture. 
which basically is putting uh, an alcohol in maybe a mason jar, um, probably vodka. We wouldn't use rubbing alcohol. Uh, it would be something that, uh, you know, like vodka or something like that. And then we would put the dried flower buds in that, put a top on it, let it set at room temperature, shake it periodically, uh, do that for maybe a couple of weeks. And that alcohol will pull the oil out of um, the flower buds. And then um, you would want to strain the flower bud pieces and stuff out of the, the vodka, leave the top off the jar of, uh, of uh, vodka, lavender, uh, vodka with the, the lavender and the oil in it. And then over time, that vodka uh, or the alcohol will evaporate out and that will leave you the oil that then you can use uh, at the end of the process.